All right. So um, back in 2015, which I can't believe is eight years ago already, um, but uh, Bruce Jenner, who was a former Olympic gold medalist, and uh, at, by that point was pretty much only known for marrying a Kardashian, um, but he announced that he was transitioning to become a woman and changed his name to Caitlyn Jenner. Um, and that kind of sparked a huge nationwide debate within our culture around the issue of transgenderism and what does it mean to be a man or a woman. Um, it happened again in 2020 when the actress Ellen Page announced that she was transitioning to become a man and uh, changed her name to Elliot. Um, there's been a huge debate um, about women's sports and whether biological men should be allowed to compete in women's sports. Um, we've seen this happen in cycling, mixed martial arts, swimming, um, even beauty pageants. Uh, right, that, that there, was, there was a biological man that won a, a women's beauty pageant. And so it started, again, there's this, this huge debate going on that even just 10 years ago, Nobody, nobody thought much about this, right? Before, like, 2012 or 2013, nobody, this wasn't on anybody's radar. And now, all of a sudden, we're being forced to think about this issue that previously was unexpected. And what does it mean to be a man or a woman? Is there a difference? Is it possible for someone to change genders? Uh, so this morning, we are going to talk about the issue of gender and look at the biblical view of it. So here's your, here's your warning, right? We're going to get into some really serious stuff, right? Our sermon series is unapologetic, where we want to boldly declare the truth of God's word, but we also are commanded to do it in love and gentleness. Um, so we're going to try not, we're, we're not going to make a, a joke or a mockery out of this. We want to treat it seriously. We want to see what the Bible actually says. And so we've already covered uh, topics like marriage and the, the value and sanctity of life. Um, and then today we're going to cover gender and the difference between men and women. And then we've got one more next week that we will wrap up this sermon with. Uh, but just so you know where we're going to go, we're going to look at what does the Bible actually teach about gender. And then we're going to contrast that with what the world is currently teaching about gender and see where that comes from. And then to wrap this up, we're going to look at how should we as Christians lovingly and truthfully respond to this issue. And I'm going to warn you, it might be a little different than what you were expecting. So we'll, we'll get to that. So we're going to begin in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1. Um, so you, you should be pretty familiar with this passage if you've been here the last few weeks. Um, I think we've read Genesis 1 every week of this series because it's so foundational. Um, next week, next thing, I think we'll be in Genesis 3 instead of Genesis 1. So we'll, we'll mix things up for next week. Um, if you don't understand the first three chapters of Genesis, you don't understand the rest of the Bible, and you don't understand what it means to be human. Right? These are fundamental passages that, that set our entire worldview of how we should look at everything of what it means to be a human being made in the image of God. So Genesis 1.27 is the foundational passage in the Bible when it comes to gender. Right? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Right? So there you have it. According to the Bible... There are two genders, right? That, that seems, like, it, it shouldn't be that controversial, right? It was, it was common sense for all of human history until literally the last decade. Um, and this is what the Bible teaches, and this is what Christians have always believed, right? That humans exist on a binary, that there is a difference between men and women, and that difference is determined not by your subjective view of yourself, but actually by your chromosomes, right? There are XX chromosomes and there are XY chromosomes that from conception will determine whether you will become a man or a woman. Now, there is a such thing as intersex. Um, these are people that sometimes are, 
they're born with an XXY chromosome, and sometimes even actually are born with both genitalia. Right? This is a real condition. It's an extremely rare condition. It affects about one out of every 10,000 people. And even then, they're usually, much, they're usually still male or female. Right? But there, there are exceptions to this rule, but the exception does not disprove the rule. The existence of intersex people does not disprove the fact that there are men and women any more than the fact that there are people that are born with six toes. That does not mean that humans don't have ten toes. It means that there was some kind of genetic defect, right, which happens all the time. There's all sorts of different ways in which people are born not in a normal way that they should have been just because there's corruption that happens in our genetic code when it's passed down from one person to another as a result of sin, right? But humans exist on a binary. There are men and there are women, it's, it's really quite that simple. That is the foundation of all of human life and all, of, all, all animals that produce, reproduce sexually exist, male and female. Without that, there would literally be no more humans. Um, I want to move on to another passage in Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. And this is, this is out of the Law of Moses. He says that, a woman shall not wear a man's garments, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. The word abomination is interesting. It means something that is morally disgusting or reprehensible. Um, and at least within, within the, the, the Old Testament law, almost every time it's used, it's talking about some type of sexual deviancy, like homosexuality or bestiality, or idol worship. There's a really interesting connection all throughout the Bible between sexual sin and idolatry, that if you like to like, go on like, really deep Bible studies, that's an interesting one. That's, that's a rabbit path that you can go down. Um, right, but it says that it is an abomination for a man to dress like a woman or for a woman to dress like a man. And we have another passage in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 6, this time coming out of the New Testament. Um, and this is, this is a more difficult one. This one isn't quite as clear cut, but it says it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. Now, the first half of 1 Corinthians 11 is one of the harder passages in the Bible to try to interpret. Um, it doesn't mean we should shy away from difficult passages. If you come across a, a verse or a passage in the Bible that you don't understand, it simply means that there is a part of God's plan that you do not yet understand. And it's often those, those really difficult passages that reveal the most about, about God's will to us when we take the time and dig into them. Now, that being said, I do not have the time to fully dig into 1 Corinthians 11 uh, this morning. So I'll just give you the, the really short version is this is basically echoing what it says in Deuteronomy 22. That there are things that are masculine and there are things that are feminine. In that it is a sin for a man to intentionally portray themselves as a woman or vice versa. Now what makes this so confusing and difficult and something that we have to wrestle with is that what's considered masculine and feminine is usually very culturally dependent. Depending on where and when you live, masculinity and femininity look differently. For example, is it masculine or feminine to wear a skirt? Feminine, right? That's, that's not a trick question, right? It's, it's, it's considered a feminine thing in our culture to wear a skirt. But if you go to Scotland and find some six foot eight Scotsman wearing a kilt and tell him he's feminine, he'll throw a giant rock at you because that's what they do over there. It's a Braveheart reference, by the way. Uh, Right, so again, right, a lot of these things are, are culturally dependent, and we have to admit that. And by the way, it's okay to question some of these cultural stereotypes as well, 
right? Just because you're a woman who would rather work on cars and watch a Sylvester Stallone movie doesn't make you a man. And if you're a man who's not okay with expressing his feelings, that doesn't make you a woman, right? And so some of, some of these cultural stereotypes need to be pushed back on. Drinking a 32-pack of beer and putting the biggest dip in your mouth does not make you more of a man. It just means that you're going to get fat and your teeth are going to fall out, right? And so there's some of these things that it's okay to push back on. But what is true of every culture is that there is a distinction between what is masculine and what is feminine. And so what both of these verses are saying is that it is a sin to intentionally portray yourself as the opposite sex. If you are a man who wants people to think of you as a woman or vice versa, that's when it becomes a sin according to what the Bible says. Um, there's one more verse that I want to uh, look at, and that is in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Meaning, these people don't make it into heaven. Right? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor what the ESV says, men who practice homosexuality. And I added another thing in there um, because... I, I like the ESV, right, every time, 99% of the time, if you hear me quote the Bible, it's going to be out of the English Standard Version. Um, however, I think in this case, they didn't do a great job translating this um, because the phrase that says men who practice homosexuality in Greek is ute malakos, ute arsenikoites. I, I don't know if I actually pronounced that right. I'm trying. I don't actually speak Greek. Um, but it literally means nor the effeminate, were literally soft men, nor sodomites or homosexuals, right? So there's, there's two distinct things that for some reason the translators of the ESV decided to combine in one. So I put it in, in brackets there for you, right? But so it is, even in the New Testament, it is explicitly condemning men that try to portray themselves as women, right? There is, there is no way around this, that if you believe what the Bible says— then you have to believe that transgenderism and cross-dressing is a sin because the Bible clearly teaches it both Old Testament and New Testament in multiple places. Now, we're going to come back to that verse at the end, but I want to pause there and let's switch over and let's look at the, the world's definition of gender. So according to modern gender theory, uh, your gender is separate from your sex. Right? So if you've never heard this before, this, this might get a little confusing. So let me try to explain it. So your sex is what you are assigned at birth by your doctor based on your genitalia. Your gender is, something, is, is a social construct. It is something separate from your sex, and it is determined by how you self-identify. So if you are a man who identifies as a man or a woman who identifies as a woman, you are what's called cisgender, right? So I would be a cisgender man. If you are a man who identifies as a woman or vice versa, then you would be called transgender, right? You identify on the other side of the spectrum there, on the other, the other side of the binary. Um, and by the way, the, the, the clinical term, the medical term for this is gender dysphoria. When you feel like your, your subjective self, right, how you view yourself and how you view your gender does not match your physical body, that is a clinical term for gender dysphoria. It's a real thing. Um, now, there's some other th ways, there's some other th ca or kind of categories. Um, Non-binary is someone that views themselves as being anywhere on the spectrum other than man or woman. If you're anything in between, then you would consider yourself non-binary. And then the really confusing one is gender fluid. This is your, your gender identity or your gender expression can change at any time. So one day you dress like a man, one day you dress like a woman. And apparently we as the rest of society are supposed to just keep up with how you feel on the inside. I'm not sure how that works. Um, right. 
this is, a couple weeks ago, or the, the first week of this series, we talked about truth and the idea of objective truth. There are things that are true for all people across all time. And the only way for that to be true is that truth has to be something outside of ourselves, something that we should be searching for. Right? This is one of actually the, the greatest arguments for the existence of God is that we, know there, we, we all know that there are things that are true across the board. And so in order for that to be, there must be some kind of moral being outside of ourselves that determines that, and that's what God is. But as our culture, we rejected God a long time ago, and when you remove God as the, the supreme moral being, now you just bump down to what's the next thing? That's us. And so therefore, culturally, right, what we call postmodernism is the idea that, that, your, that truth is determined by each individual. And so this whole gender theory is just simply the logical conclusion of this postmodern worldview that says that all truth is subjective and everyone gets to decide what's true for themselves. Then I get to be whoever I say that I am regardless of what I look like or what's medically true. Right? That's, that's just, that's what, where you end up when you follow that logic. Right? And so to, to summarize this, according to the Bible, there are men and women, and men are supposed to be masculine, and they're supposed to marry a woman. And women are supposed to be feminine, and they're supposed to marry a man. This is, this is what we've believed for thousands and thousands of years and what has caused humanity to flourish. According to modern-day gender theory, your gender is separate from your sex, and gender exists on a spectrum, and there isn't just two. I think at one point Facebook said there were like 72 different genders that you can change from, and then that number keeps expanding because if it's all subjective, then you can make up your own. That's literally what happens. And so now they just put, they have a custom line where you just write it in um, because they, I, I don't think they can make the tab that long to, to scroll through everything. Right? And so, so gender is a spectrum, and then sexuality is also a spectrum. So you can be whoever you want to be, and you can be attracted to whoever you want to be attracted to. Right? These are two very fundamentally different ways of viewing the world, and they're not compatible with each other. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to just, I, I don't want to just make fun of the other side. I'm trying not to present a strong man or a straw man argument, right? That what, I, what I'm telling you is what people actually believe in what is being taught around, or in universities and in schools today, right? This is what people actually believe. Um, and there's actually a very dark history behind this ideology that I'm going to guess most of you are probably not aware of. Um, so, uh, in, the, in 1965, there was a man named Dr. John Money, who's on be the, the left-hand side here. It's backwards. Um, he's on the, the left-hand side. Uh, and John Money was a very prominent psychologist and sexologist who was, he did not invent gender theory, uh, but he was a very early pioneer of it and very influential and so in 1965, Dr. Money, which just sounds weird to say, you know with the last name Money, it can't be good. Um, but so Dr. Money founded the very first gender clinic at John Hopkins University. That same year, there were twin boys, Bruce and Brian Reamer. Um, this is a later picture uh, that's next to him that you see on the screen there. Um, twin boys were born, uh, but unfortunately, during a botched circumcision, Bruce's penis was mutilated and was actually, like, burned off. Um, and so, Bruce and Brian's parents, who were just ordinary, blue-collar people, were like, what do we do? Our, our son... Our son doesn't have a penis. How are we supposed to respond to this? And so they saw, uh, they saw Dr. Money on the news, and they decided to go pay him a visit at John Hopkins University. And so while they were there, Dr. Money, who was very eager to prove his new theory about gender, and so he convinced Bruce and Brian's parents that gender is not determined by your biology. Gender is merely a social construct. And so if you raise your son as a girl, then he will be a girl. 
And so the parents, not knowing any better, they listened to the doctor. And so uh, Bruce went through uh, gender reassignment surgery, and they changed his name to Brenda, and they were told that in every way that they need to raise Bruce, now Brenda, as a girl. You're going to dress him as a girl. You're going to give him girls' toys, right? In every aspect of life, treat Bruce as if Bruce were a girl, right, as Brenda. And so that's what they did, despite the fact that this entire, right, as he grew up, they treated him differently than his twin brother. But despite that, Bruce continued to act like a boy, and he always wanted to play with the boys' toys, and he didn't like wearing dresses and all of these things. And so as the boys were growing up, Dr. Money would go on to publish a lot of papers and books um, celebrating the success of his experiments, a one-person experiment that now proves that his theory on gender is correct. And his theories would go on to shape the entire academic world in this field in what is currently being taught in universities and schools, even as young as kindergarten right now. But despite this, in 1999, Bruce slash Brenda went on, uh, I think it was 60 Minutes, and gave a public interview exposing Dr. Money as a hoax and a fraud. He literally said in the interview, you can go online and watch this, and he's like, people, they, they were celebrating my story as if I were a success. He came out and told them that th in his early teenage years, he became very depressed and suicidal, and his parents, not knowing what to do, eventually gave in, and when he was 15 years old, they told him the truth, right? You are biologically a male, and we gave you this surgery because we weren't sure what to do. And so he immediately transitioned back to being a male, and he took the name David. He would go on to get married and be a stepfather to his wife's children and try to resume some sort of a normal life. Uh, but he said that John Money ruined both his and his brother's lives. The entire time, right, he, they, would, they would do annual meetings with Dr. Money where the parents weren't allowed in the room, where he was sexually abusing these children. In 2002, his brother Brian died of an overdose, and in 2004, Bruce slash David committed suicide. This is, this is the, the experiment that proved modern gender theory. It was a one-person experiment that failed miserably. Dr. Money was a liar, a fraud, and a pedophile. He actually openly endorsed pedophilia in some of his academic works. And this is the man that is shaping what our children are being taught today. Right? Any, anybody see this on the news? Anybody taught this in school? No. Right? This is the inconvenient truth that they don't want you to know. Right? That ideas have consequences. This is the consequence of this type of ideology. So now, how as Christians are we supposed to respond to this? Um, and I think it's very important. We're going to do this in two parts, and we're going to separate out. We're going to look at separately the sin from the sinner. Um, and I want to be very clear that when we address these two issues separately, we need to take very different tones on how we address them. So first, let's talk about the sinner. The Bible calls transgenderism an abomination. So therefore, if we want to be consistent with what God's word says, if we believe this is the inspired word of God, then we must do that as well. Right? Again, like I said, this is an ideology that has disastrous consequences that we must fight against. Uh, right, so legally, we need to make sure that, that we are fighting against this. Every year, there's more and more legislation being proposed that would regulate the language around gender and, and around the use of pronouns and, and mandate people to use certain language. I am fully convinced that some, at some point during my ministry, everything that I have said this morning will be considered hate speech. And I think the first consequence is that those of us that refuse to bow down to this false god of gender ideology, we will be punished by losing our tax-exempt status, 
and think of how many churches across the country will be forced to close because they won't be they won't be able they won't be able to afford their property taxes. Um, along those same lines, uh, universities and schools that do not endorse this ideology will lose their accreditation. It's hard enough for a Christian college to compete against the state aid and the the state-funded tuition that public schools have, that if they're not accredited, they won't be able to get enough students to stay open, right? And so many of our Christian high schools and colleges and universities will end up closing down as a result of that, right? We're already seeing this happen in places like Canada where they're doing those very things. Um, We must also fight to keep this, again, out of our schools, um, this is this this is the thing that like we see online and it's easy to get really angry about. But this is this is coming here as well. I believe it was was it Dunkirk High School um, just recently. They they were promoting that they were having a student drag show, where underage boys were going to parade around as women, and that people from the public were encouraged to come and watch this. Fortunately, they ended up canceling or postponing indefinitely, I'm not sure. It's, it's been postponed because enough parents made a stink about this, right? That this is not something that our children should be endorsing, right? And there's, there's all sorts of videos online of, of teachers trying to brainwash other people's children with this ideology. Now, I don't want to bash teachers. The vast majority of public school teachers are very good people that genuinely care about their students and want what's best for them. But they're also being told to teach from curriculum that's being selected by boards that are made up of political activists, right? That this is the consequences uh, that, or these these are, but this ideology is infiltrating everything that we do. We have children's shows that are teaching kids how to use different pronouns, and and right, like they're explicitly teaching this thing through to our children through television. Right, so again, this is something that we must stand up against. This is a demonic teaching that directly contradicts what the Bible says, and it is diminishing what it means to be a human being. Right, and we cannot allow this to happen in our society as much as we are able to. Now, I want to talk about the sinner. And here's where things change a little bit. Because we can't address people the same way that we address policies. As far as policies go, yeah, right, we we put our foot down. But when it comes to addressing individuals, we need to learn to treat this with great compassion for a couple reasons. First of all, think of when you were like 13 years old. Did you know who you were when you were 13 years old? No, right, just think of all the terrible fashion trends that you went through at that age. Right? And so kids at that age are struggling to find their identity. And there is nothing more than a, a young person that age wants than to feel love and acceptance. And so if you're searching for love and acceptance and you can't find it, all you have to do is come out as gay or trans And there's an entire community that is going to welcome you in with open arms and celebrate you. When you put yourself in their shoes, you can see how appealing that is to a young person who is confused and doesn't know what's going on. Which, by the way, isn't that what the church is supposed to be for? Anybody, regardless of where you've come from, if you are willing to find your identity in Christ, right, that's literally what a Christian means, it's of Christ, if you are willing to repent of your sins and say, I, I want to become a Christian, we're, we're going to welcome them in with open arms and celebrate that. It's the same thing. It's essentially a religious experiment or experience on both sides, right? So we need, to be, we need to be very mindful of that, of why a lot of these kids are doing it. Um, and also, we need to realize that gender dysphoria is very real. This is a clinical diagnosis. These people genuinely feel like they are trapped in the wrong body. And again, we can talk about biology, but that doesn't deny the fact that they genuinely feel that way. Right? And so if we, if we deny the way they feel, all we're going to do is turn that off, or is, is turn them off from listening to what we have to say. But really what's going on is they are claiming 
that their biology does not match their psychology. And we need to be willing to accept that. But where we need to push back is why do we assume that it's always the biology that's the problem and not the psychology? You can change your mind. You can't change your body. Right. Again, gender dysphoria is a real issue, and we should have real compassion and sympathy for the people that struggle with it. But the solution is therapy, not surgery. Right? That's where we need to come along and, lo- and, and be able to lovingly and gently encourage people to do this. Because here's the thing, and this was, I, I want you to hear me out on this. Right? You don't get to choose what sins you struggle with. Right? These people genuinely feel this way. If you struggle with same-sex attraction, right, and we're like, oh, just stop it. Right? Men, stop being attracted to women. Can you do that? No. But I can choose how I act on those feelings. Anybody willing to admit they struggle with anger? Any, anybody have a short temper? A couple of you raise your hands. Yeah, stop it. Is that helpful? No, you have to learn ways on how to cope with that. Right? And here's the thing. All of us are born sinners. From the moment you were conceived, your sin nature was inherited from our first father, Adam. You are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. It is part of who we are. Every part of our being is corrupted by sin. Every one of us has a sin nature. And that sin nature is going to reveal itself in different ways to each one of us. Every one of you has your sin of choice that that you tend towards, right? We all struggle with different temptations. For some people, it's lust. For some people, it's greed. For some people, it's lying, right? There's there's all different things. For some people, it has to do with your gender and your sexuality, Right? Why do we judge people because they sin differently than we do? Right? Every one of us has a sin nature, and every one of us, that sin nature, is going to express itself in different ways. But we are all held accountable for what we do with those temptations. And the job of a Christian is to recognize where do I personally fall short of what God says is good for me, And then how can I bring that into conformity? Whether it's removing temptations from my life, whether it's learning how to cope and handle with them, whether it's it's learning like mental ways to separate myself from those temptations. Right. And again, and some of these require real therapy. Some of these require you to sit down with somebody who's really trained in that specific area to teach you how to recognize the shortcomings in your thinking and how to align that with what God's word says. Right? Repentance looks a little bit differently in different things, but all of us are called to repent from our sins. Um, I read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 earlier. I want to reread this again, but I want to keep going and look at the next two verses after that. It says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. Right? Those are all things that we're very quick to be like, yeah, those are terrible. But then look at the rest of the list. Nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor reviler, nor, re- nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Right? What Paul is saying is that these people do not make it into heaven. But verse 11, as such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Every one of us are born sinners. Every one of us deserve judgment from God because of that sin. People don't go to hell because they're trans. People don't go to hell because they're gay. People don't go to hell for having sex outside of marriage. People don't go to hell for stealing. People don't go to hell for getting drunk. There's only one thing that sends you to hell. That is rejecting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So we can... We have a tendency to make certain sins really big deals, really big deals within the church, 
right? And, and some of them, right, these sins do have disastrous consequences. And like I said, culturally speaking, we need to be willing to put our foot down and say, no, this is wrong. We will not go along with this. But we also need to recognize that if it weren't for grace, we would be in the same position, And regardless of what you've done, regardless of what your gender identity is, regardless of what your sexual attraction is, regardless of what sin you face, there is forgiveness for those who are willing to cry out in the name of Jesus and ask for it, right? This is the way that we handle these issues. It's a sin issue. We treat it like every other sin issue. We call people to repentance, that every one of us in some way or another are living outside of what God says is best for us as human beings. And so as Christians, it's the, the daily task of putting ourselves to death and living for Christ, right? That if we're in Christ, we're a new creation, right? That doesn't mean our sin nature is erased. It means that we're trying every day to get a little bit more like Jesus. We all have struggles, We need to stop judging people that struggle differently than us. And we need to all focus on repenting from our sins, whatever they may be, and to align ourselves with what God's word says. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for for the forgiveness that is offered in Jesus. Uh, regardless of what our sin is. And, and sometimes it may not seem fair that some people's sins seem bigger than others or some are harder to overcome. Uh, but ultimately, we thank you that we don't, we, no matter what the sin is, we cannot overcome it in our own strength, but that we have forgiveness because of the works of Jesus on the cross and that we have the promise of the Holy Spirit who will come into us and who will wash those sins away, but also empower us to overcome those sins and teach us and guide us how to live a righteous, godly life. I pray if there's anybody in this room or listening to this right now that has not put their faith in you, that, that you would just draw them to yourself and that you would, you would help them to, to come to that conclusion that they cannot live apart from you and apart from your grace. And I pray that as we go out into the world that we would not be judgmental or hateful, that we would be marked by grace, but also by truth. Help us to have the courage to stand up for what your word says, but also the love and the gentleness to treat people as image bearers of God who are in the same position that we were before we put our faith in you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.